Um, we've um, not coincidentally worked both in critical care topics in the past, and I think that's a, a, a large strength of our lab in Cambridge. Um, and that's a topic very near and dear to my heart um, as an app, uh, ultrasound application scientist. I'm actually a PhD trained scientist. I've worked in diagnostics and therapy uh, for brain and cardiovascular applications. Um, but very recently we started a new program within uh, research uh, that's led out of the Research Cambridge office that's focused on new ultrasound applications and users in antenatal echo care. Um, and we are pursuing a machine learning based uh, product and pr prototype and product around this initiative to build on our strengths and Phillips at identifying new users um, and applying their novel machine learning um, um, tools to um, help open up these new channels. So I'd like to spend some time walking the group through this today um, and, and set the scene for where our initiative is right now, just after a few months um, and open up the, open up to any questions that the group has uh, about um, both the machine learning aspects, because I know that this forum is focused on that topic, but also the general topic of the value proposition in this area. So I'll start with some ultrasound applications uh, background to build on the um, introduction that Manon gave to uh, our department. Talk about antenatal care delivery, what we're starting to understand very deeply about key challenges and some of the initiatives already um, underway within Phillips to address some of these challenges. Walk through our new initiative and relationship with the Gates Foundation in this area called the AI Enabled Obstetric Application Suite that we're targeting on our Lumify platform. And then hopefully leave a little bit of time for discussion and QA. Although I'm happy to take any questions during uh, during the seminar if anybody has it. Um, okay. So as Manam mentioned, our lab um, is co-resident. Uh, we have a number of different topics in our lab, and we're situated in a very rich ecosystem of health tech. Um, both research and, um, and companies in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. Um, spans, obviously, the very rich technology development that happens at MIT. It has, touches almost every aspect of the, the Boston community, but also energy, IT, data, biopharma, and uh, a lot of venture capital that we are um, increasingly becoming more plugged into um, as the years progress. So our... Uh, our department within Phillips Research in Cambridge actually touches three different topics. Uh, ultrasound, uh, which I'll talk about very briefly. I'll assume that folks in the audience have a general working knowledge of ultrasound and what it is. Um, won't go too deep into ultrasound, um, but I'll, I'll also assume that you know what it is. Um, also image guided therapy and healthcare informatics. Within the ultrasound space, we have a very um, rich group of ultrasound application scientists that span um, from bread and butter ultrasound development, image formation, beam forming, uh, to quantitative ultrasound, the way of quantifying different biomarkers uh, in the forms of elastography, super resolution imaging. We're also heavily focused on exam workflow and automation, and also new clinical applications that can arise from new insights that you can derive by recognizing features within the ultrasound um, image. And also, as I mentioned, identifying new users and use cases of ultrasound and point of care, patient monitoring, and also uh, low resource and rural settings. Um, so we'll dive into that a little bit more deeply here in this talk. So our um, research group has done a lot of work in the past um, both productizing and building novel prototypes to expand the use cases of ultrasound. First, um, one example being the Philips Heart Model. It's a product that is on our premium platforms that allows uh, ultrasound transducers that generate a three-dimensional image to automatically orient themselves in the, the space of the heart and identify and quantify 
uh, different chamber volumes and the dynamics of the heart by way of a model-based machine learning approach. So taking what you know about how the heart should look, applying a model to it, and then using novel machine and deep learning uh, techniques to make it more generalizable across the population and more robust and, and, and uh, real time. Um, we focus in our department very strongly on our handheld Lumify platform. Uh, I won't go too deeply into Lumify, but Lumify, for those who don't know, is a handheld pocket ultrasound system that Philips uh, introduced to the market a number of years ago. Uh, it runs um, on both Android and iOS devices uh, across a fleet of devices in both of the, on both of those platforms. Um, and you um, can plug essentially a, a number of different transducers that address different uh, clinical applications across the body into your own pocket device. Uh, and it can run for hours and scan um, with very high image quality that um, in many cases compares uh, to the premium large cart-based systems. So we think our department and the uh, ultrasound application scientists in our group think that this is a very um, key enabling technology that's happening across the space that Philips is a very strong player in due to our uh, high market leading image quality in this, um, in this area. We've also worked on things um, to enable new users to ultrasound. Uh, one example is uh, trying to expand the use of transesophageal echo. Um, this is an example of us applying some novel machine learning object detection methods on uh, ultrasound data uh, to identify different, uh, different um, tissues within a moving heart in the ultrasound image to identify different anatomies so we can associate that uh, with how the probe is oriented in the throat. So a transesophageal probe is actually inserted uh, down the throat so you can look at the heart with very high, um, high resolution. Uh, using this type of approach, you could enable a new user to perhaps place a probe and subsequently quantify different um, parameters of the heart, like the left ventricular volume from which you can derive things like stroke volume, cardiac output, etc. cetera. Um, so um, our, our group in Cambridge wants to build on these synergistic, the, the build and synergize these experiences to expand to new areas. Uh, one of one topic we want to get much more involved in, we've partnered with the Gates Foundation to expand our reach here is to touch the mother and child care journey, um, both from you know, antenatal care uh, through intrapartum care, labor and delivery into postnatal care. And we're, one thing we want to do is team up across Philips and across the inter industry to apply our knowledge and experience in the ultrasound applications area. Uh, to new um, to new settings. Within Philips, there is actually an initiative that's been in the, in the market for a number of years called MOM, the Mobile Obstetrics Monitoring Solution. Um, and it aims to address a lot of the challenges that we know already exist in mother and child care um, through a longitudinal data tracking application that is built on our Philips Health Suite cloud. Um, that allows all the information during the first essentially thousand days to be longitudinally gathered and tracked across the healthcare system from on the go to home to the healthcare uh, center so that data can be shared between mothers, community healthcare workers, care providers uh, to enable a seamless journey. So it, and it addresses uh, the registration of the patient, vital signs, providing key information to to the patient, gives them knowledge about their pregnancy and baby health, um, and also a caregiver app that provides information to the caregiver you know, at the time of need. Um, as part of this uh, mother and child care journey, um, our team has been talking with the Gates Foundation for a number of years about some, some opportunities. And in this space, we recognize even further need uh, globally to address key challenges in antenatal care within the mother and child journey. Uh, some key challenges we recognize collaboratively with the foundation 
is poor access to care in remote locations, very difficult to share data seamlessly by way of inefficient workflows. Um, and of course, these, these challenges are also uh, evident in other, in other um, uh, settings, but particularly um, together in, in the uh, in low resource settings become even further compounded. Uh, shortages, shortage of doctors and minimally equipped midwives for, for providing antenatal care and also operating ultrasound and a dire need to, to identify early uh, high-risk pregnancies. Um, so we've teamed up with the foundation to really help achieve and understand the care continuum and how you can develop technology to achieve, to, to, to um, develop um, towards a mission of allowing one ultrasound scan before 24 weeks gestation for every pregnant woman globally. Um, what we've done is built on our experience within, within Philips to, um, to build on the, what the mobile obstetrics monitoring team has done uh, to take our, our ecosystem of solutions across Philips, uh, which, which um, include both uh, teleradiology, um, telecommunication sharing within our REACTS application within the Lumify environment that allows a care provider uh, an echo operator to connect with an echo professional or their colleagues uh, when they when when they need it most to interpret an image or make a clinical diagnosis. Um, the mom patient application caregiver app, um, the web portal, um, and our health suite digital platform. We want to extend the reach of ultrasound by way of image acquisition uh, assistance and image interpretation assistance built directly on our ultrasound platform that allow automation of key antenatal screening parameters um, by way of novel machine and deep learning techniques implemented locally on the handheld device. So we are targeting um, a platform where a plurality of these clinical functionalities is actually achieved. We're targeting six of them. Um, and we've outlined with the foundation nine potentially high impact clinical screening functionalities that we'd like to enable. Um, we are, we started this program a couple months ago, really. Um, we're looking at it as two phases. The first phase is going to develop a prototype that we're actively pursuing right now and involve data collection and annotation of data. As we all know, machine learning annotation of that data is paramount. Um, you need, it needs to be curated properly and you need to understand the environment in which the data was acquired in order to glean um, insights optimally. We're going to develop alg an algorithm for at least six of the features, develop a regulatory strategy to go to market sustainably um, in, in a plurality of geographies. And we'll also develop a standalone research prototype uh, that's been tested with users in target geographies um, within the, sc the scope of a couple of years. After this, we're going to go to market um, with, this, um, uh, with this prototype um, by way of the strategy um, we've defined in phase one. To do this, we are, as I mentioned, te teaming up across Philips. Uh, we have, a, as Manan mentioned, a number of different research sites across the globe. Um, Namely, in this program, it's driven by three, separately, three of our research sites. Um, it's driven from Philips Research North America with our experience in ultrasound AI, Lumify software, and, and understanding uh, the value proposition to customers and the business. Uh, a lot of experience within our Philips Research Kenya lab in Nairobi around mother and child care and low resource care delivery. Um, and also our Philips Research Bangalore team uh, with deep experience in obstetric ultrasound, AI, and software. So this is really a global program. Um, very excited to be able to make um, hopefully large strides here to identify the problem across the care continuum and determine where technology and machine learning, new machine learning tools can actually play a part because technology doesn't solve everything. You have to, you have to understand the full societal problem and how um, new tools like data-driven algorithms play play a role there. Um, <clears throat> we're taking this project very seriously. We have, a, we have a global team that spans 
uh, myriad functionalities across the whole product development um, process from data scientists, data engineers, clinical scientists, uh, medical doctors, regulatory quality, clinical affairs. Um, everyone's engaged in this program. So we can tackle this problem just not just from a technology standpoint, but across the whole uh, continuum of product development. Uh, and we're working hand in hand with the Gates Foundation to ensure that our global access mission uh, is fulfilled. We don't uh, stray away from that. Um, one thing we're starting off, um, and Manan mentioned about this briefly um, in her seminar, uh, within Philips, the first thing we ask ourselves is what is the value proposition uh, of any initiative? Um, and it, that question revolves around three different pillars. It's what's the value to the customer? What is the offer? And what is the value to the business? Um, so for example, around the customer, we, before we start developing technology, we need to understand where potentially, if we do develop it, where will we get our business from? Because it has to it has to pay for itself. It has to be sustainable or else we'll introduce a number of devices to the market and they'll just sit there um, and, and nobody will benefit from their use. Uh, what problem are we actually solving? Um, uh, what What is in the market right now? What's the current uh, what's the current practice? What kind of products or services, if any, do they use? Who, are, who is actually going to pay for this? Who is going to be the buyer that says yes? Um, that's a really important question to answer before you start to develop technology or start to uh, theorize which machine learning networks might build this new tool for this end user. And how big is the opportunity? Um, the offer, what exactly are you asking the, the potential customer to do and what benefit does it provide to them? Um, when you really, really boil down to the details, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the upcoming slides, uh, this matters a lot. Um, why, why should that person believe that this new tool will actually make a difference in their, in their lives and or their professions? Uh, and also from the business, does this fit Philip's brand strategy and positioning? We have to, we have to, Phillips can do a lot of different things. Um, we have a lot in our backlog to use some of our own nomenclature. Um, wh which things should we actually do and how does it fit our, our brand strategy? Um, and some other things, risks are something we, we talk about a lot these days and especially, um, you know, with the advent of, of deployable real-time you know, machine and deep learning tools, there's a lot of, they're, they're data heavy. Uh, and we need to be extremely mindful of data privacy uh, in a global world right now, which brings risks both to Philips, but also to the patient and healthcare systems. And that's something we take seriously from the beginning. Um, this value proposition process uh, is a continuous process. We, we engage with customers across the entire care continuum. It starts with potential end users, in the case of our initiative, it could be a community health worker, medical officer, um, a midwife, uh, a sonographer, an OBGYN, Ministry of Health official, a governmental official, World Health Organization official. Um, uh, anybody who touches the, you know, the payment, the buying process, the, the potential device, the healthcare system in any way, is part of this value proposition process. You need to understand their perspective and what decision they would be making with what evidence uh, in order to really understand the problem from a holistic, uh, holistically. Uh, so this is something we'll be doing throughout the entire program, but focus, focusing on very strongly from the beginning in order to set our initial user needs and business needs from which we can define what sort of machine learning based tools we should be aiming for. Um, We've started, we've started our value proposition process and identified um, some key questions and challenges in the obstetric ultrasound domain in, in low resource settings, particularly. Um, we understand it, within, the, within the assessment, some of the big questions are, what, what, is the, what is the lie of the fetus and what's its presentation? How many do you have? Is it a multiple gestation? Uh, where is the placenta, generally speaking? Uh, this is something without the, um, without a 
an experience echo um, operator uh, on hand, these are some of the, the quick questions folks need to know in order to, to risk stratify um, during the course of a pregnancy. What is generally the, the volume of the amniotic fluid? Uh, some additional challenges, the scan, the actual scan is inherently difficult to perform, even if you are a trained sonographer. Uh, it's operator dependent modality ultrasound is compared to CT or MRI. Um, you've essentially ultrasound is different in two major ways. Uh, the field of view is limited. So it depends very strongly on how the operator is manipulating the probe over the surface of the body to uh, interrogate a volume. Um, and then also the contrast to noise ratio uh, is, is not, not very high with ultrasound. The resolution is really good, but you've got a lot of um, more or less contrast, contrast noise that you're having to deal with. Um, so it makes for a lot of operator dependence. Uh, there's a, obviously a complex and dynamic fetal organ anatomy with, this, with the respect to the placenta and the uterus. So you, there's a time dependence to this that, that's very different from say cardiac or brain imaging. Um, there are ultrasound artifacts for those who are schooled in ultrasound understand this very well, but the propagation of sound through the body introduces different, uh, essentially um, call them errors or um, well, they're artifacts within the image that can actually be used uh, beneficially if you can recognize them. So we need to be able to recognize these uh, and also getting energy into the body. Um, ultrasound is more or less a, a benign um, imaging modality. It uses non-ionizing radiation. And it's been shown to be very safe for both mother and child. Um, but you have to be able, the, the amount of acoustic energy you get into the body determines how well you can actually image. Um, so we're, we're concerned with uh, you know, the body habitus of the mother to make sure we can get enough energy in to create a good image. Um, also, understanding what the goals of uh, medical, re medical research community is important. Uh, do they want to enhance the training? Do they want to simplify the procedure? Um, how, how standardized are the outcomes? Um, maybe in light of time, I'll skip through this about acquisition assistance. But um, one of the first questions we're asking ourselves is what exactly are we building in this program? Are we building something for a community physician that's trained in obstetrics um, that would be following the standard of care, uh, standard of care for, for antenatal echo examination? Are we building something for a midwife who's got OB experience, um, but doesn't really know how to operate an ultrasound probe? Uh, would they need, would they wanna follow guided standard uh, acquisition protocols? Um, do they need on-screen guidance uh, or do they, they need something much more autonomous like a blood pressure cuff? Or do you go down to the level uh, in echo competence of a community health worker that has tremendous reach within their community but doesn't have extensive medical training or, or uh, obstetrics expertise? Presumably you can reach a lot more individuals by targeting a health, community health worker but you need to develop inherently very different technology. You can't expect a community health worker to manipulate a probe uh, and find a perfect view that um, the data produced obeys you know, global society guidelines for quantifying um, and per performing screening. So the one big question our program is wrestling with is who exactly are we building something for? Um, because the technology you aim to develop uh, simply follows your answer to that question. Um, there's been a lot of work done in the community already around building uh, more autonomous technology um, for, all, for someone like a community health worker or a, um, med a medical officer. And in the ultrasound community, these are called blind sweeps where you allow, um, you take a pocket ultrasound probe and you manipulate that probe over the maternal abdomen in order to essentially perform a volumetric sweep. And from that volumetric sweep data, you can feed that into a large deep learning model and do a direct prediction of something like gestational age or, or twin pregnancies or placenta previa. Um, 
this would could be seen as sort of the precursor to more advanced technologies like a full ultrasound patch that would fit over the maternal abdomen and provide uh, a wealth of, of imaging data that can be fed to a you know, more sophisticated model. Um, there's also been a lot of work done in the community already um, by both um, startup companies, uh, other players in the ultrasound space, um, and academic labs. Um, there, I'll point out some examples where the baby checker uh, implemented an obstetric suite protocol. No, no image was shown to the user. The probe was manipulated over the maternal, maternal abdomen. That data is fed to a, you know, a sophisticated deep learning model uh, to directly predict the orientation uh, and the gestational age uh, of the fetus, which is a really important screening um, um, piece of, of screening information. Um, no image is actually shown to the user. You could almost argue that this is like a blood pressure cuff. Um, there, are, there are a lot of regulatory implications of doing something like this, where you take, you depart from the standard of care workflow, um, where in this case would be to actually manipulate the probe, find um, what, what we call standard planes of something like the head circumference or the abdominal circumference, measure that, and then associate that with, uh, with a screening estimation like gestational age. Um, these are some of the regulatory questions we all have to, to wrestle with when we're developing machine learning models where um, the, the, the black box is not interpretable. In the end, we're having to convince a care provider that our technology is extending their reach and giving them more confidence that they're providing a diagnosis. Even if a, a black box model like this is more accurate, we have to convince and, and impart the confidence to the care provider that indeed it is more accurate. And they're, they're making a, a clinical decision that's based on sound evidence. That burden is on us as technology developers to do that. It's not on the care provider. Um, very quickly, just um, a sneak peek into what we're doing. Um, some of those parameters we showed um, earlier on in the presentation uh, around you know, multiple gestation, fetal presentation, and amniotic fluid. Three different algorithms we're developing. Um, some of the confounding factors we, we will end up running into, as I mentioned, are fetal movement. Um, how, do you, how do you optimize different image acquisition settings on the device uh, in order to ensure that you're getting the best resolution, depth, and gain without requiring that the operator spend 10 minutes twiddling with knobs. Uh, all of this information can potentially be gleaned directly from the image itself uh, in order to get the best image possible. So all of that stuff is quote unquote under the hood. Um, there are some challenges already reported by the literature. We know that um, the amniotic fluid pocket is uh, difficult to to detect due to things like reverberation artifacts. And as I mentioned before, the artifacts within the images that we know are there, we need to be able to recognize and autonomously either disregard, pull out or address by way of the, the tools we're developing. 